Hi everyone, my name is Laura and welcome to Book Bubbler. Happy Friday Reads everyone. Um, hope you're all doing well. It's been a bit of a busy week for me this week, unfortunately not regarding reading, but just with work. Um, and I've had a little steam to do some, I would say spring cleaning, but it's just like overdue cleaning anyways. Well, you know what? It's happening in the spring, so let's call it spring cleaning. Um, so I've been doing a lot of that stuff. And just, quite honestly, binging Superstore from the beginning for the first time since it ended. I'm very sad it ended. I really loved the show. Um, and it makes me laugh out loud, genuinely. <laughs> so um, I've been doing a lot of that as well. So, uh, Song of the Week this week. I bought myself an iPad, you guys. And it's my first tablet. I feel like I don't know what I'm doing, even though it's the same as my phone, essentially. But I know crazy, right? So the song of the week this week is classical, and that is Prelude in C-sharp minor by Sergei Rachmaninoff. Um, this was a song that, or this was the song that I blacked out in in a performance. So, <laughs> fun fact, when I was a senior in high school, I was in, I mean, I was, all four years, I was in the Milwaukee Youth Symphony Orchestra. You audition, it's the same essentially as the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra, only everyone is in high school and middle school. So I was the principal for the viola section my senior year in the senior group. And we played a, an orchestral version of this prelude, which I have been hard pressed to find a copy of, a recording of anywhere else. I don't I don't know of any recording. It's always just for the piano because that's what it was written for. Uh, Rachmaninoff is a piano man, pretty much. Um, so we played this and it's beautiful and it's quiet and it's haunting. I like stuff that is in minor keys, generally speaking, more than major keys. And um, I really loved it. And the whole performance and like rehearsals and everything, I was so looking forward to playing this because it was my favorite little piece. We had, we all had an interesting part this time, like lots of sharps that would pop out that you weren't really quite aware of as an individual note, but they just blend and it makes it so intensely interesting. Anyways, I'm geeking out about this. Okay, so cut to the performance date. And <laughs> I am so psyched for this. And we start playing and I play the first two or three lines maybe. And then the next thing I know, it's over and I hear applause. Now I didn't like black out, black out, as in I passed out and I dropped my viola and I fell over and like none of that happened. But I have no memory of playing. I, It's a total blank, complete and total blank. And after, after I kind of came to or whatever happened, I was startled and I, I turned to my, um, standmate and <laughs> I said was I playing this whole time and she was like yeah what are you talking about and like I don't remember the song she was like what I'm like oh later so we finished the concert totally fine but the whole time I'm playing I'm thinking what the hell just happened so unfortunately this thing that I have been like so excited about and rehearsing for and everything I literally blacked out for and don't remember so there's the fun story behind the song of the week this week. Um, I hope you enjoy it. And also this channel um, on YouTube, Rousseau, Rousseau, R-O-U-S-S-E-A-U. They have 3 million, 3.73 million subscribers, excuse me. It's beautiful to watch this person play. It's an overhead and there's lights and everything. It's very cool. Let me see if I can do part of it without getting dinged for something. Come on. Nope, go away. Okay, this is gonna be terrible lighting because I can't figure it out, but see what I mean? So fascinating to watch. Ooh. Okay, anyways. Um, yeah, okay, put this to the side, quit focusing. Books, we're here to talk about books, right? Uh, okay, so I'm getting rid of one this week and I had one come in, so that evens out just fine for me. So the one I'm getting rid of is <laughs> This very cheap copy of the Mabinagion, uh, this wall of text, Dover edition, bye-bye. 
huge, huge thank yous to one of my favorite channels, Heather at Saki Expat Book Nerd, who, when I talked about this previously, um, probably for the uh, my Mark Two BR, I think I said, if anyone knows of anything, could you recommend a different version that's not this cheap thing? And she recommended me this version that it's on its way from Book Depository, uh, and it's includes photographs of the real places where they exist still for Tales of the Mabinagi. So I am super psyched to get it in the mail. I got a notice this morning that it's on its way officially. So I'm going to get rid of this one. Bye-bye. And then the one that I hauled is my Book of the Month Club pick. Sorry. Or Waiting for Rain. Let's see if this will help with it. Ooh, that is a uh, black sky. Okay. I have to load my car up with uh, paper stuff. Um, cardboard boxes to drop at a friend's house on the way to work so I better get talking faster anyways <laughs> the one I hauled my choice this month was Liberty by Caitlin Green Greenage 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 so this is loosely set in the 18th century and yes no um, a young black girl is um, she's freeborn in Reconstruction era Brooklyn her mom is a practicing physician. Her mom wants her to go to medical school and they can practice together then. But Liberty meets a man from Haiti and he says, come with me back to the island, marry me, you'll be an equal. And she goes to Haiti then, marries him and finds out that that is not the case at all. She is very much subservient to all men. And because her mother was light skinned and could pass as white and she is very dark skinned, there's no way she could have passed. You know, she was worried about this. So it's about race and this woman's life and this is also based on the life of a real one of the first black female doctors in the United States so this should be really interesting it's being hyped everywhere I'm excited to read this sooner than later which of course means any time within the next five years okay so I finished two books this week the first I'll talk about is this one there's more to life than this by Teresa Caputo I like reading mediums memoirs and stuff about what they do and how they do it, how they channel people, if their guide is one that's channeling and they talk to their guide, um, uh, all sorts of stuff like this. I'm into it. So uh, I really enjoyed this. Unfortunately, it wasn't a super engrossing read. A lot of the times I'm just sucked right in and I'll read the whole thing in like two sittings. I, and I could very easily put this down and leave it for, you know, a week or four days or something. It was still interesting to hear about Teresa's life and um, how she channels people, how she protects herself, uh, some of the tales that she's had of um, doing readings for people and um, results from that and, you know, on the other side and all that stuff. So this was very interesting. I gave it four stars. Um, if you like Teresa and you like this kind of stuff, I say it's worth a shot. I do watch the show. I didn't watch it for several years. I maybe watched a year or two live and then I don't think she's been on in quite a while, but I did enjoy it. You know, it's not a life at all like I have. So it's interesting to see people's lives, but yeah, I enjoyed this. This was interesting. And the other one I read, it was ebook. Finally got around to the very first Inspector Rebus book. This is Knots and Crosses by Ian Rankin. I should say, I knew this was an older book, the start to the series. I know it's very popular and I, he stopped writing for a while and then started writing again with the same character. Um, oh, blah, take a breath. Um, so this was written, or sorry, published in 1987. And I wasn't sure how old it was when I was reading it. I, you know, whatever. But uh, so it is a little sexist differently than I think it would be if it was written today, but it, it's fine. It wasn't horrible. I have certainly read lots of books, and I'm sure you guys have too, that were way worse than this one was. So, but just sort of a heads up, like this was written in the 80s. So we follow um, Inspector Rebus, John Rebus, uh, family life. He has um, an, an younger brother, excuse me, I thought he was older, younger brother. Um, his mom either died or left when he was young. And his dad and his younger brother were really two peas in a pod and they excluded him a lot when he was a child. Not in a mean and nasty way necessarily, but just naturally he was just excluded. Both his father and his older brother are stage hypnotists slash magicians. And he is a DS in the Edinburgh uh, police force. So he is divorced from his wife. He's got a teenage daughter, Samantha, who's 13, 14, somewhere around there. And... Some of it is that he is getting these anonymous 
letters with a little like a match stick cross or a string with a knot tied in it. He's been getting them for six or seven or eight weeks and he just thinks, oh, it's some nutter. And the, the note inside is something generic like, I'm giving you clues, you know? And he's like, whatever, I, ignores them. Just pretty much ignores them. Tells one person one friend of his about it, but they both go, ah, whatever, it's some crank, you know? He happens to know where he lives. He thinks I'm somebody else. I don't know. He just like outright ignores them, essentially. Um, at the same time, he is working again, um, as a cop and just doing his thing. And there is a serial abductor and murderer of young girls, like eight to sort of 14 age. And he has a feeling he's going to get pulled onto the, that team. And he is pulled onto the team. So he's starting to investigate and, you know, trying to find the car that check, run down all the leads for like the possible car this guy was seen in. And of course there's active abductions and murders happening as he's investigating as the case goes on. He's semi-dating um, a, a woman who also works for the Edinburgh PD. She is their um, PR person. So you see them have like an affair a couple of times and they're sort of friendly and not um, also working not alongside, but you see this person's point of view is Stevens. He's a reporter, a newspaper reporter, and he knows that he suspects highly that uh, Rebus's younger brother is dealing drugs and he thinks that our John Rebus is is also involved in it because otherwise how could he not know so he's trying to tie this all together on the side and still cover these murders and abductions and things so eventually all of these lines meet all the storylines meet in a fairly um tense scene at the end it's not super super tense I could read it just fine at night it was okay but I wanted to see what happened um I will say, so I, I liked it. It wasn't great. I'm, you know, two or three stars, but it's the start of a very long running series. And like any first book, I think this is also her first, first book, but any first book in a series, you know, you're setting up a lot of stuff. There's groundwork to lay. It's not necessarily the best written thing in the universe, but it's not bad at all. So I enjoyed it. I will continue reading the rest of the series at some point. I'm trying not to just go whole hog and read like the first three or four in succession and then ignore them for years. If you've noticed, that tends to be what I do for a series. Um, so I'm trying to keep this like more normal every few months, maybe try and read a book, you know. Um, I will say that Rebus is, you know, kind of sexist. Um, you can tell that this book was written by a man just by how he describes Rebus himself physically. And then also he how he describes Jill and how he describes his ex-wife. Um, it's, it's very gendered, a very gendered viewpoint. Hello, Cardinal. Um, and so I will say that, and the whole thing with him receiving these anonymous string, knotted strings in the mail and everything, and him totally, seriously, not even cluing in that this could be important to anything at all, is so maddening. It's so maddening. You think, how can anyone be this dense to not see any kind of potential maybe, perhaps, kind of a th nothing. There's none of that. He just flat out ignores it until like the last 15% of the book or something. And, and then I was like, come on, come on, dude. And then he kind of, oh yeah, well, there's this, hmm, I, hmm, I saw this, I guess, yeah, whatever. And the person he's talking to is like, what? <laughs> um, so that was very frustrating. And the whole book is very like, um, adagio pace like very just normal pace and everything you get to the end and then it's like this huge mad dash of activity and like running around and all this stuff and he's going to confront the killer at the end and he literally walks there <laughs> he walks to confront him by himself there should be a whole police force like <laughs> I think a lot I said are you kidding me like <laughs> So, so ridiculous. Like, who effing walks to confront this serial killer, strolls through the city, explaining about the architecture and the history a little bit, and you cross a bridge, and you blah, blah, blah. Like, no, dude, you were trying to save your daughter's life, you know, and you're confronting her potential killer, this guy who has murdered tons of girls, and you are walking by yourself. Come on, get real. That was so frustrating. Anyways, so, <laughs> okay, calm down. 
All right, so sorry I was yelling too. <laughs> so excited about this. I was like, you have got to be joking. Anyways, wrap it up. Um, so frustrating wasn't the best thing I've ever written, but I am curious to see what happens too. Plus I have always wanted to watch the, at least two different TV series adaptations I know of for Rebus, one starring John Hanna and one starring Robbie Coltrane. Just on feel and looks alone, I think I like the Robbie Coltrane version better than John Hanna. No offense to John Hanna. Maybe it's not John Hanna. I don't know. Anyways, but someone who looks like John Hanna, nothing else. Um, so yeah, I, I'll, I'll try those and see what happens, but we'll see. I don't know. Also, that's all I have for books for this week, but really quickly, gosh, 15 minutes. How do I do this every time? Laura. Um, uh, there's this TV show that's newer, new now. It's on Acorn. If you've got, if you guys have Acorn, it is so, so good. It's Irish. It's called Bloodlands. It's amazing. So a couple of weeks ago, my mom came over and we were just watching TV. Like I said, what do you want to watch? She doesn't have anything streaming anything. I said, it's up to you. I can watch any of this whenever. She said, oh, let's go to Acorn and see what's new. So like the first thing up is a little like picture of Bloodlands, you know. And she's like, oh, I've heard some good things about that. Let's try this. So I look at it and every Monday um, through, Mar through March, they would drop a new episode. And there was just four episodes total. So we had two episodes to watch and she's like, well, let's just see if we like it. We can watch two episodes. If we don't, it's just an hour. I'm like, all right, fine. So the first one was good. I mean, it was really interesting. It's concerning um, um, uh, the Garda and there seems to be a resurgence of a serial killer that disappeared 20 or 30 years ago. I forget which it is, but a while ago. Um, so it, it was active in the 90s and this has to do with the Troubles a little bit and the Peace Accord. Uh, and that's when he was really active back in the day. So now he appears to be back. And there's all these threads that are kind of coming together. And uh, this killer's name is Goliath. Or they, they dubbed him Goliath in the um, PD. So the cop um, who's investigating now, his wife is one of the victims of Goliath. So he's got a personal stake in finding out what's going on now. If Goliath really is active again, if it's a copycat, you know what's happening. And also they never found his wife's body. There's four missing bodies, essentially. Um, so he's investigating. You're, it's more and more tense. You know, it's, it's so good. It's really, really good. I can't think of the main actor's name, but you know him from tons of stuff. He's great. Um, so we're watching and we get to the second episode and we're like, it's getting a little tense. And one of the side characters does something and my mom was like, why did you do that? I'm like, I don't know, we'll find out. And then there is a huge, <laughs> a huge twist at the end of episode two. My, both my mom and I went, what? Like, what? And watched the whole thing, like to see if we, could, if we weren't hallucinating this twist that we did not see coming. <laughs> not even a little bit. Um, and I hate to be like, oh my God, there's a massive twist, but there is a massive twist. It's so good. So I was like, so you're coming over Monday after work so I, we can watch her there. She's like, no, it's fine. She had a bad day that Monday. And then the following Monday, I had a bad day. So we still haven't watched the last two episodes yet, but oh my gosh, if you have Acorn and you like murder mystery kinds of things, please watch Bloodlands. It is excellent. It's so good. I'm trying to get her to come over this weekend to watch it. So far, no dice, but we're going to have to watch the end of episode two again because we want to make sure we didn't really miss anything else because we were both so stunned. <laughs> like, I don't know if we were really present. Anyways, so blah, blah. All right. I got to go to work, <laughs> drop stuff off, etc. I hope you guys are all doing well and staying safe. This weekend coming up is the mid-month book bash, so I'll be vlogging throughout the weekend. You'll see that on Tuesday. Um, my focus for the weekend is to finish up reading these series of unfortunate events books. I've got four left. I hope I can do it. We'll see. Anyways, hope you're well. Um, and I will talk to you guys soon. Bye.